Well, this morning is going to be a little bit different in terms of how I'm going to uh, think with you about the Word of God. We've been uh, looking through our doctrinal statement, and we came to the statement about humanity, and we've spent, as it were, three uh, times on it. This will be the third of those, but even as we've been living our lives in the world over this last while, it's been interesting. We began by thinking about the fact that men and women were created in the image of God. And all of a sudden, boom, this week, that's an issue. Because when a three-year-old falls into a chimpanzee or a gorilla's cage or area, and the question is, what is going to be done? The question is, is there any kind of difference between what is an endangered species and significant and valuable and a human child? And the answer, in naturalistic terms, is rather hard to discover. And there's been this fascinating debate, but if you take it all what God seriously, one of them is the image bearer of God. The other is a remarkable creation of God, but something of a very different level. And what we think about other people is directly related to what we understand God did when he created human beings. On another level, of course, there's controversies about things that are going on. Let me just walk through a little bit of uh, history with you. Back in April of 2008, when uh, the president was running for the nomination, he was at a conference, or at least a, a candidate's gathering down at Saddleback Church, and asked about gay marriage. His comment was, I believe that marriage is the union between a man and a woman. Now, for me as a Christian, for me, for me as a Christian, it is a sacred union. God's in the mix. Later on, after he got the nomination, he was asked again, and he said, I believe marriage is between a man and a woman. I am not in favor of gay marriage. You move four years forward, and in the run-up to the 2012 election, he announced that uh, he'd been evolving in his view. And so um, he now supported gay marriage. And then just about a year ago, when the Supreme Court announced their decision on gay marriage, he not only uh, made the observation that it was a victory for America, he lit up the White House in rainbow colors to celebrate it. Now, my point is not to talk about the duplicity of the president. I have no doubt he was duplicitous, because in 1996, when he was running for office in, um, in uh, Illinois, he made it very clear that he supported gay marriage and thought it was appropriate. And David Axelrod, is, his uh, campaign manager, has just written a book saying, even though he said that publicly, that was not what he believed. Uh, but politicians are that way. What is significant, though, is that the reason he changed his public position was because he now knew the public had shifted that strongly. So that that was no longer a negative in terms of what his view was. And it's a reminder of how things have shifted so that two weeks ago, his administration sent out the directive to school boards and schools in the entire country directing that there's provision to be made for transgenders not only in bathrooms, which is a relatively controllable thing, but in locker rooms across the country. All of that says that our culture has shifted in a very dramatic way. And now all of a sudden to take what Christians have continually and constantly believed for 2,000 years not only makes us cultural outsiders, it makes us the objects of great question in terms of the larger culture. Is your view homophobic? Is it uh, um, actually hateful of others? Is it discriminatory in that kind of way? And if it was ever true that Christians had home field advantage, it's no longer true. And we need to uh, think through. That is why, in our doctrinal statement, we have a statement on marriage. You know, Christians have believed what they've believed down through the years, and nobody found it necessary to put a statement about marriage between a man and a woman being God's intention. But now, all of a sudden, in the current thing, it has been necessary to stay that for legal reasons. And so it is there, not simply because 
there's a legal value in having it there, but because it's a point of witness and testimony in the culture in which we live. But we need to make sure, as we see even some who've named themselves evangelical Christians, retreating under pressure from that kind of position. Is, is this really what the Bible teaches? What really does it say? So I want to take the time this morning to look with you at Matthew chapter 19, the words of the Lord Jesus, because sometimes it is said, well, Jesus didn't speak to these issues. But in Matthew chapter 19, he does. He doesn't say all of the things about transgender and gay marriage that uh, would have been absolutely ludicrous for him to talk about in the culture of that time. But he does say some things. And then I want to frame it in the larger cultural movement of the time in which we live. So we're not going to walk through this passage in a way in which normally would. Now, we begin by reading in verse 3. Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause, for any reason? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. What God has joined together, let not man separate. He said, and why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. From the, uh, from the beginning, it was not so. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciple said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who've made, been made, pardon me, there are eunuchs who have been so from birth. And there are eunuchs who've been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who've made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. In 1992, Anthony Kennedy wrote these words for a Supreme Court decision related to Planned Parenthood and abortion. Listen to them because they are at the heart of a huge amount of what is going on in our culture. I quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own conception of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. He's saying that an individual's right to forge his own conception of reality is supreme. No one, there's no right higher than saying, you have the right to define your own understanding of existence. And that has borne fruit. It wasn't intended in 1992, but that's borne fruit in which now you can say, despite all of the biological facts of my body, despite all of the realities of what DNA says about every cell and chromosome in my body, that I am male, I declare that I am female. And you have no right to say, that that is not the truth. That is the supreme right that is given. And that's behind, obviously, the transgender issue, which is kind of the next step along the light. And, and it's important not because it touches such a tiny percentage of our population. I mean, less than one one hundredth of one percent fall within those boundaries by any kind of scientific understanding of it. But because of what it says about the nature of how we think about people, and it's already having its effect. One of the studies, and I've been reading a fair bit about this over the last few weeks, one of the reports that is now coming back, and I was mentioning this in another context earlier, is that in certain circles of students in high schools, it's become the in thing to become transgender. An increasing number are going to their school 
asking for, without parental permission, hormones to change their bodily shape. Because teenagers can be very prone to be with the in thing, or to do that which will have other people stand up and take notice of something unique and distinctive. And for those of us who are older, it seems utterly bizarre and remote in another kind of, not something that we ever thought of in our world. But the ground has shifted and our culture is in a very different place and now we as Christians need to address this and we need to address it with wisdom and with grace and with understanding. So what I want to do is address this to this passage as a kind of base. I want to then think a little bit about the, some of the cultural forces that have got us here. And then I want to look back at some pillars of marriage and life that are given in this particular passage. So let's look at this particular context. Passage is normally thought to be what about divorce. And it is about divorce. That's the presenting issue. But it's really about the nature of marriage. And that's how Jesus responds. The Pharisees come to him, and in their particular context, they uh, have an intramural debate, and they know it's important to the people. What is the basis of divorce? The Old Testament, it is present, but what is the basis of it? On, on what reason? And they had split into two groups. There was the Shammai group, and there were the Hillel group, named after two great rabbis of the first century. The Shammai group was relatively, actually very strict. They said it could only be on the grounds of adultery that a man could have a divorce. And Hillel said, no, it can be whatever a man doesn't like. Um, if his wife burns the food, if there's any, and it's all a debate about Deuteronomy chapter 24. The Pharisees ask this question publicly, not because they want to know Jesus' opinion, but they know which way the cultural winds are blowing. That, hey, I mean, if you've got a choice of take the strictest possible view of divorce or take one that's open, which are most males, because this is a, a male right in Jewish society, not a female right, which way are most men going to choose? I, I want the maximum opportunity to empower my lust. And they knew that that's not where Jesus was going to come from. And so they posed this question. Can a man divorce his wife for any reason? And Jesus' answer is a striking one. And, and, and it begins with this quizzical statement. You're the people of the book. You're the rabbis. Haven't you read? Where do you go to get an answer like this? And it's interesting. As the son of God, he doesn't say... God the Father has sent me to tell you and give his answer. He said, haven't you read? Don't you know what's in Scripture? Don't you know what God himself has clearly said? And he takes them back to God's word and to God's work. He who made them in the beginning made them male and female. And he said, this is the reason a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he adds on his strength, what God has joined, don't you dare put asunder. Now, he's going to come back, and they're going to press again on the issue of divorce, and that's not my goal to think about that, important as it is here this morning. What, what, what I want us to understand is, first of all, Jesus submitted even his authority to the written word of God. He stood under the word of God. And he recognized its authority and he called that to bear witness. And the question must always come in this particular time, because we have whole denominations shifting away on this ground to get with the train of where political correctness is taking at this particular time. And we see... Uh, sadly, and I could name names, and I'm not going to do that, people who used to be known as, quote, evangelical, shifting their position, not because what God has said is any different, but because the culture now puts pressure on you for saying those kind of things. So one of the first things that we need to understand is for Jesus, the source of authority is what God had do has done and what God has said and the source of those who name ourselves as followers of Christ must be that we live under the authority of Scripture as well. Now, let me just back away from this for just a minute, and let's just think about in that world. First of all, you have the Jews 
And uh, the Jews were the most conservative of those of moral standards in the ancient world. They were that for two reasons. The first was because they had the law of God. And the law of God had indicated two things. First of all, that one of the first victims of sin, and we talked about sin a couple of weeks ago, and the entrance of sin was into the relationship between men and women. What's the first instinctive response? when they sin and rebel against God. It's to cover from one another and to blame one another. The man and his wife were both naked. Now sin has meant they're covering and they're blaming one another. And into that most significant of God-given relationships, sin had entered. So the Old Testament talks with great specificity about various kinds of ways in which sin manifests and why it is in fact sin. And yet the whole system of Judaism had at this particular time uh, arisen to quite honestly oppress women and to empower men's lusts. Even this question, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? Doesn't talk about what a woman's rights are and what a woman's position are. And for the any reason says, if I want to walk away, uh, then I can and I want to enter into other relationships. Now the Greco-Roman world, if, if the Jewish world was hypocritical mor morality, the uh, Greco-Roman world was moral anarchy. So that everything went in almost every conceivable kind of way. So that before the New Testament finishes being written, you will not only, you'll have a parade of uh, emperors on the, in leadership in Rome and to read about their private lives is to end up living in a sewer as finally epitomized by, by Nero, openly parading through the streets uh, with his homosexual lover and uh, killing off wives and all of these other things. And the reality is the early church knew that and it came out of that particular context. There are all of these what are called vice lists in the New Testament that warns against certain kinds of sins. And yet the nature of believers in the early church says, don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor adulterers, nor ad idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. So Paul is saying in that particular context, I'm not talking to people for whom this is theoretical. You, you've come out of this life. You know what this life is like. You know where you were, but you were washed. You were made clean. It doesn't mean that the temptations have gone. It does mean that God has broken into your life in a significant way. Now, I want to kind of move away from the text for a minute and talk about some things that have got us here in our current, in our current context. Because... Um, you know, having been in pastoral ministry for, I'm not sure even, have, I don't count because it makes me feel old, but uh, more than 40 years, um, the context in which I began ministry is not the context in which things are happening today. And, and, and what's brought us there? Well, let me just talk about five things that have, have got us to this place. The first is the sexual revolution. Sexual revolution in some ways, obviously people have always been sinful. They've always been sinfully immoral. They certainly have been in the Western world. But in 1960, the birth control pill was introduced. And for the first time for both men and women, sexual activity of whatever kind could possibly be separated from a major consequence of that kind of activity. And so then you had the 60s. The pill, the birth control pill, may have started the 60s in 1960, but by the end of the 1960s, those of you who remember the hippie era, every kind of pill was being used in that particular way and every kind of lifestyle. It was in some ways strange enough that people in the end of the 60s would make trips to drive through Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco to look at the strange way people were living. And the same thing up in Canada. There was uh, certain parts of my home city of Vancouver that you'd drive down to see this kind of 
moral circus that was going on. But in the process, an infection was setting deeply into the culture. Now, coupled with that was the sexual revolution, and they're not disconnected, was the divorce culture. When President Reagan signed, as a governor, a Governor Reagan, Ronald Reagan, signed the no-fault divorce bill in California, and all of a sudden, someone could unilaterally step away from a marriage. A huge tidal wave began to inundate American marriages. And we know the effect of that. The effect of it was increasing breakup of the family. And by 1980, the number of divorces had reached their pinnacle. And by, in some ways, we can be thankful that the divorce rate has declined since then, except except that those who were the children of the divorce culture, and obviously that still exists in significant ways, but the children of the divorce culture turned away from marriage to cohabitation. <coughs> so while our divorce rate has fallen, the reason is because the marriage rate has dramatically fallen, and we have cohabitation, which has meant this amazing increase in the number of children who are born outside of stable marriages and families, um, which in certain parts of our population reaches 75% and in almost every area close to 50%, which has this whole demeaning of marriage or this lack of understanding of marriage in other particular ways. Now, a third factor comes along and breeds in around this same time and is the feminist movement. The feminist movement, in many ways, was rightly directed at abusive situations related to social roles for women that women did not have and were not uh, able easily to enter into. And we can go back and talk about much of that was entirely appropriate and greatly needed. But alongside with the mainstream of the, uh, of the, uh, the uh, feminist movement, there came the radical feminist movement. And the radical feminist movement not only questioned gender roles, it began to question gender. So you had departments. They first were called uh, women's studies at universities. Then they began to be called gender studies. And those gender studies began to affect the whole kind of understanding of gender itself. So gender, rather than being thought of as a biological fact, a gender related to that, is now viewed as fluid in significant ways. And so there's a fluidity so that there's a disconnect between my identity. And so how do they even talk about what goes on in hospitals? A child is born, and what do they do? Well, in modern parlance, they assign them a sex. Now, everything within me says, no, you're not assigning. I mean, what you're doing is looking at the raw facts that are right there in front of you, and you are designating. Now, do you understand a simple difference of terminology makes a huge difference of understanding, which leads right into where we are in terms of both gender roles related to same-sex marriage and in transgenderism. And it goes back to a radical theory that developed in large measure out of the feminist uh, context. A fourth factor, so you got sex, and these are all obviously interrelated in significant ways, and yet they're running on different tracks that converge together. So we've talked about the sexual revolution, the divorce culture, uh, the feminist movement more on the radical side, and obviously you have gay activism. And uh, after, and, and I won't try and go into the history of all of this, but after the stone, uh, I'm not even getting this right. Stonewall's not the right word, but I can't think of it. Um, a, an uprising that I heard that related to gay bar in, in uh, New York City, there was this massive movement that began to develop of gay activism. And they have been strategic and clever and careful. And it first began as a movement to tolerate homosexuality. But then tolerance became, no, you have to accept homosexuality, which then became a movement to affirm homosexuality. 
And it is no longer enough to say, I understand you are this, and you know what, I value you. Um, and you must affirm not only their struggles in that area, because there's little doubt that people, for various reasons, feel song, same sex attractions. And I can accept the reality of that and identify and have compassion toward that, but to affirm that the only way to resolve that is to be involved in homosexual practice is quite another. And then we move to the fifth, and I've already talked about the fifth in another context. And so, and that is the term that is, I think, most useful to describe it is the cultural value of expressive individualism. Expressive individualism is the context that basically says the best way to find yourself is to look within yourself. And you have a responsibility to be who you are. If you're not being who you are, and you get to choose that, then something is wrong. You need to act out on the basis of that. And so our sexual identity is now viewed as the essence of our real identity. So that if you are a person with heterosexual drawings or homosexual drawings or confusion related to that, that is your essential identity. And you need to be, to use a good Shakespearean terms, true to yourself as you define yourself. To which the Bible whispers in the background, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now, with, with that kind of landscape, and that's the moral landscape in which we, in which we live uh, and, and is celebrated in all kinds of different ways, let's come back and think about the pillars of marriage and the pillars of human life that are given in this passage. And they are simple and they are straightforward. The first pillar number one is the statement that Jesus says, in verse 4, when he says, He who created them from the beginning made them male and female. Male and female is a creational reality, not a social construct. That is who we are. That is how we are made in the presence and nature of God himself. And as Christ followers, what seems to be extremely obvious also needs to be that which is non-negotiable. It's consistent through the Old and the New Testament <coughs> that men are to live as men and women are to live as women. And there's obviously cultural gender roles. There's obviously cultural things that are different, but there's a core reality that there is male and there is female. And never in the Old Testament or the New Testament is there anything but condemnation for homosexual activity? And I want to make that clear, homosexual activity. We'll come back to that in just a moment. So that's the first pillar, central and significant. And that's why we say in our statement about God has made us male and female. The second pillar is that God's intention is permanent heterosexual marriage. Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female and he said for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh and God said quoting back to the Old Testament it is very good. And so Jesus quotes these verses that they knew well to remind them that God's intention was becoming one flesh. That marriage was intended as a human gift for our good. It was a divine provision for our good. So that's why after having made men and women, God says it is very good. It is God who made the man. It is God who made the woman. It is God who brought them together in the, in the garden. And so marriage is a divine provision for good. It has a divine pattern for good. Man shall leave his father and mother so that the relationship between a man and woman becomes the highest loyalty of his life. 
and he shall cling to his wife, cleave to his wife. And that becomes the central commitment of his life, and the two shall become one flesh. And that involves the process of intimacy that is woven into the reality of that experience. It's symbolized in the act of sexual relationship and, and realized in part there, but it is what God intends. The third pillar is that sin has entered what God created and its contaminating effects is felt in all kinds of different directions. Now, divorce is clearly part of that. And one of the challenges for Christians is that as we make a strong stand against homosexual marriage, we need to recognize, and, the, and Jesus here makes an exception related to divorce, divorcing except for the cause of adultery, so there are exceptions. But the ease with which Christians have developed the no-fault divorce idea, this isn't meeting my needs, is rebuke to us. We cannot say strong things about, against homosexual marriage if we are not saying strong things against the easy divorce culture that has crept into the evangelical community at a far higher level than it ever should. But look at verse 12. Jesus talks about singleness. And in verse 12, he says something that is intriguing. And I only have a brief time to deal with this, which has quite significant indications. The disciples, verse 10, say, if such is the case of a man with his wife, that you're stuck glued to each other, it's better not to marry, <laughs> which says something about his disciples. <laughs> But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, only those to whom it's given. For there are eunuchs who've been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who've been made eunuchs by, by men, and there are eunuchs who've made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Now, what I want you to notice about this is that the, there's three categories. And the first two are physically, in some way, eunuchs. Eunuchs from birth, those who've been made eunuchs, by people. That was a common practice, sad common practice in the ancient world and has been related to people who were royal officials put in charge of the harem and so forth and uh, they were mutilated so that they would not be a threat to the king's treasure and those kind of things. And then he says there are those who made themselves eunuchs, that is they've chosen to sing, live a single life for the cause of the gospel. And if you begin to think about that category, there are two people who right away from the top emphasize the value, the glory, the, the goodness of singleness, and that is the Lord Jesus himself, who chose that pattern of life for the sake of the kingdom of God, and the Apostle Paul. So that's a significant, but I want to go back and think about that first statement. There are those who are made eunuchs from birth. In other words, they're physically incapable of marriage from birth. Now, some of them are because of physical anomalies that occur in their development and affect their organs of different kinds. The current term for that is intersex. And, and there's this mysterious kind of reality about some individuals who are born with a kind of mixture of male and female in their organs. That is clearly, on one level, an effect of sin. That is, just like others of us will be born with a genetic defect that will make us liable to multiple sclerosis or cancer or something else. It is not a moral issue, but it is ultimately due to sin that's come in in that particular way. And so we need to come to this passage with the recognition that even the Lord is recognizing, you know, sin has affected what God has made in a significant way. And it's true also for some and people, uh, the, the studies still go on trying to deal on uh, Jesus at this point with, I don't think, talking about those with same-sex attraction but it's undeniable that there are many, and I've been reading the stories over this last week of some 
really godly, fine Christians who find themselves struggling constantly with same-sex attraction. And the reality is there's two very different groups in our culture, and we need to be wise enough. They're the advocates, they're the zealots, and then there are very ordinary people, and some might be here even in our midst this morning. And the best known secret of your life is, I struggle with these attractions. I didn't choose them, I don't want them. What do I do with them? How do I understand them? How do I live through them? Because the reality is, and Elizabeth and I have had the opportunity over the years to find ourselves involved in some very moving and challenging kind of context where we're trying to walk with people through struggles that aren't our struggles. But let's face it, there's none of us here. Whether we grade ourselves number 10 on heterosexual who doesn't know there's something deeply broken within our own sexual feelings and agendas and, and, and challenges we have and lust that we deal with. So none of us look in the mirror and say, <laughs> well, sin effect didn't affect me. Well, I don't need to dwell on that any longer. But the issue is that while the Bible clearly condemns homosexual behavior, it's not saying that it doesn't come alongside those who have same-sex attractions and come with compassion and grace. We need to speak truth about homosexual marriage in our culture. We cannot do it. We will not do it. It isn't part of what we is. But people with same-sex attractions are welcome to our fellowship. And we would love the opportunity to walk alongside and love and care and wrestle with you if that's an issue that you are struggling with. Because we're all broken sinners who need the grace of God and to know the work of God in our lives. So it is as important that we say pillar three as it is that we say pillar one and two. That we affirm the reality that God is a God of grace and truth and we need to speak to people in grace and truth. And some of you wrestle with this, not on the issue of, of your own struggles, but I, I can guarantee it. Um, if you're not now, you will. There'll be somebody, several people in this room who will be wrestling with what their children are saying or their grandchildren or some relative who is now coming out and wanting on one level to endorse not their attractions, but their actions. And if we're asked to endorse their actions, we can only say no. Now God calls you to trust his grace to deal with this. And we'll walk with you through that. We'll try to bear your burden and fulfill the law of Christ. But if someone comes and says, I need to be honest, this is what I'm wrestling with. I, I don't know why. But when I look at a man and I look at a woman, I think one thing toward someone who's the same sex as I am and nothing toward the one that I'm supposed to be attracted to. Then they need our love to draw alongside and to discern how do we how do we walk with them if they're willing to walk with Christ in it and to willing to wrestle well? A friend of mine had a motto for his church in which he said, we are a group of people seeking to struggle well with life. I think that's a great description for a local church, isn't it? Because we're going to struggle. By the power of God, it isn't only a struggle. And it isn't a struggle on our own strength, but we're going to struggle, and God help us to struggle well with life together to the glory of God. Well, I don't know whether this, where this message fits you. I wanted to use it as an opportunity to just kind of talk about our culture, talk about where we are, to recognize that we as the Church of Christ are in a very different place than we've ever been in the culture in terms of our own lifetime experience. And we have to expect to be increasingly marginalized, increasingly challenged. Some of you live with this in your workplace. 
If you're in the school system, if you're in the medical system, you're faced with this challenge. If you're in certain businesses, I mean, think of what's happened. The NFL, Bruce Springsteen, Apple, and all kinds of other corporations threaten to boycott areas because they won't get go along with the current flow. That's the culture we're now living in. God help us to do it faithfully and compassionately for the glory of God and help us to be just an island of people who are struggling well and seeking to stay faithful. Father, may that be so. Help us to live in this culture as salt and light. May people see our truth as we stand for what is right, but may also see our grace as we seek to imitate our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.